Welcome to CGTN Africa. This is Laura Wallabengo, and you are going to watch a show that we're doing today on femicide. Now, what is femicide? Femicide is the intentional killing of women, but I won't break it down for you just yet. I have with me on set two panelists. Uh, on my extreme left, we have Daisy Amdani. She's the executive director of Community Advocacy and Awareness Trust Kenya. And to my immediate left is Pastor Waweru Njenga, better known as Pastor Wa. Now he is an urban church planter and pastor. So um, before we kick off the conversation, perhaps uh, Mrs. Daisy, you'd like to um, introduce yourself and tell us exactly what you do. Well, as you said, I am the executive director of the Community Advocacy and Awareness Trust, also known as Crown Trust. At Crown Trust, we do many things. We do advocacy work, we do civic awareness, uh, we do advocacy on women's rights, mm -hmm. uh, policy advocacy, and general activism around women's rights. General activism. <laughs> yes, where, where women are concerned, anything that is good for women and where women must be involved, we are part of that. We also do some public interest litigation. Why, why is it important to, um, to be a part of general activism, so to speak? I think it's important because activism is being an active citizen. And one of the uh, tenets of democracy is public participation. And if we want to ensure that the government is doing right by the people, we must learn to be activists. Mm -hmm. Because it is assumed that governments always mean well. In reality, they have shown they don't always mean well. Mm -hmm. Plus, to ensure inclusion, accountability, transparency, because as part of our democracy, when we exercise our right to vote, mm -hmm. to choose the people who will represent us, we must also exercise vigilance in ensuring that they are representing our interests. So for us, we um, do a lot of advocacy for women's inclusion because women are excluded from so many spheres, economically, culturally, socially. and it, Unless we raise our voices, we will continue to be marginalized. I like what you say about the, assuming that the government has your best interests at heart. I'm looking at it like a relationship. Mm. So it, the government says this, and if you're not okay with it, then you need to speak up. You should. Yeah. And since we talk about relationships, somebody who I think is very good at understanding and dissecting different people's relationships is Pastor Wa. Yeah. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle of a transition right now, uh, but an urban church planter involved in uh, planting churches in the capital cities of Africa and reaching people in my demographic. I say I'm passionate about the 25 to 45 year old, mm -hmm. um, upcoming, you know, a podly mobile African. And so one of the things I'm really passionate about as, as a because I'm also a trained not just a pastor I'm a trained life coach as well mm -hmm. uh, it's just relationships and how the whole um, dynamic of people are evolving in relationships within families outside of families and and how people can be able to build you know happy and successful and meaningful lives from their relationships uh, so so yeah so that's that's what I do I've done that for you know uh, close to 20 years now <laughs> so um, quite passionate about that and being able to do it in different African contexts I think it's, uh, it's, it's been uh, quite a journey. I guess it, it is uh, you know when you're sitting in your seat maybe in East or West Africa yeah. it's hard to imagine what's happening around the continent yeah. and one of the things that has come up and which is the topic of discussion today is femicide. Right. Now apparently femicide was coined by some author in 1976 but I imagine it has been happening for much longer than that, probably right. centuries, so to speak. Right. And uh, the reason it's coming to light is because there are very many different reasons for femicide itself. So you have the intimate femicide, then you have the femicide to protect the honor of the family, and then you have femicide, maybe if there's a dowry deal that has gone bad. Yeah. And there's so many different reasons. However, intimate femicide, I guess, is the hardest to understand because if you're in a relationship with someone, at what point do you turn and kill them? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, judging by what the discussions that have been going on in social media, it now stops being about killing your partner and becomes about 
why did you kill your partner? Right. Was it reason A, B, C, or D? Now, let me just drop some stats here. So according to the United Nations Statistics Division, uh, 2015, the proportion of women exposed to physical violence in their lifetime hit 48% in Mozambique and 59% in Zambia. What would you attribute this to? I think I should, I should start with you, Daisy. I think first and foremost, for me, I attribute the increasing levels of violence against women to the low status of women in society, mm -hmm. where women are not valued as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so people begin to think of them as dispensable and not even having human quality. That for me is where it begins that low status of women. Because even when you look at how shocking these statistics are, mm -hmm. you will find that very few people actually are moved by these statistics. Because when, this is violence against women. Yeah. But when you think about the number of women who die in childbirth, when you think of the number of women who die in war, mm -hmm. situations of war, yet there is no hue and cry from the world, you know? Uh, a plane, an aeroplane, will fall from the sky. And I'm not saying that it's okay, but you think about the kind of emotion and the kind of concern that is elicited when you have, uh, you know, planes crashing and you're talking about maybe 300, 400 people dying. But when you look at the number of women who are being killed, either through violence in war situations, from, uh, you know, um, uh, while giving birth, mm -hmm. intimate uh, partner uh, violence, you know, intimate part partner murder. Yeah. How many plane loads of just women, just women, do we have? And how is it that this is not an area that people are focusing on? How come it doesn't elicit the kind of reaction that it ought to elicit that human beings, very critical people mm -hmm. are dying you know and for me that's what i attributed we just keep churning out statistics and every year they increase they do, increase and do you and think so the, the, the increase is in direct proportion i guess to the population increasing and not necessarily uh changes in culture or anything like that first of all if it's in proportion to the num the population growth i think it's worrying because it means that as populations grow Trends do not change with respect to women. The status of women is not changing, okay? For all the money that goes into advocacy around violence against women and the increase in the trends, we must begin to ask ourselves, why are these trends growing? Why do we see more violence against women? And in, in fact, more um, convoluted uh, uh, violence, mm -hmm. you know, so that now we have resolutions on sex or sexual violence being used as a tool of war and the majority of the victims are women but there is no there is no redress there is th th there's very little that is being done to address the problem including addressing the plight of those who are victims or survivors i think of i think such violence i think we can get to that a bit later because uh, there's a lot to hash out in terms of uh, terminologies and in terms of uh, consequences of certain behavior and things like that but let me uh, take the question to you now pastor Wa. what would you attribute this rise in physical violence against women to so it's interesting the statistics you gave are uh, Mozambique and Zambia. Yeah. I, I, I lived in Malawi, which is sandwiched in between those two, <laughs> um, and worked there. Um, but I think that, to, uh, to me, f there's, there's, a, there's a cultural element into it. Um, and what, what ends up happening is usually, in, 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 if you look in traditional African cultures, uh, the role of men and women were pretty clearly defined. Um, you know, you grew up in a home, you knew the men went out, took care of the animals and did whatever, found food, brought back, the women stayed at home, or took care of the garden and the children and so on and so forth. But there's been a shift um, since a lot of these African countries gained independence, there's been a shift. And, and first of all, just the, the lines of separation between men and women have been blurred. And so there's, there's greater interaction between the two and roles have changed, obviously, for obvious, obvious reasons with 
um, the advancement in technology and all that. And so the distances between the genders have significantly reduced. What, what then tends, out, ten, tends to happen is the, the, the differences or disagreements or whatever it is, whatever you might call it, in, you know, conflict uh, is obviously um, hap ten will tend to happen more, will be more pronounced because um, you know, people are much more closer to one another. The second thing that then now happens is because of the, the type of work people are doing, there's, there's just generally increased pressure on people economically, um, on the family unit. And so people really are pushed. I mean, you look at people in the cities and, mm -hmm. and the cities that, and African cities that I've lived in, people are just pushed. Um, life is just hard as it is. And so what that tends to happen is because there are narratives in our, in our culture that tend to, and, and as a man, you know, I have experiences that tend to say, to, to, paint, to paint men as, um, as the more dominant in a community, in a society. And so they're worthy of respect, and especially in our, in our culture. Any, and, and when we look at the new workplace or the new interactions that are as a result of all these changes, it means those change a little bit. Like, I mean, we're sitting here and you're interviewing us. Um, <laughs> Now, to, to someone who's probably more exposed and, and more, you know, has a lot more different uh, experience, that's fine. But to someone else is like, so, like, if I go and talk to my great-grandfather, grandfather will be like, so why was this woman asking you this very difficult question? <laughs> you know, um, there's, there's something I was reading today which made me really circle around the whole culture mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. So just this year, some more statistics. Just this year, in Kenya, 40 women have been killed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the same span of time, 35 women have been killed in Canada. Yeah. Same reasons. Yeah. So where, where, what role does culture play there? Exactly. I, here's, here's what I think. Uh, you, to, to finish the thought that I was saying, I think that when people are pushed, um, as we see culturally, um, and especially men, and then they have no... I, I, I feel like the men in our cultures and our society are not trained. We're, we're not raised to know how to resolve issues. Um, and so, if if there's a, you know, somebody feels m my spouse or my lover disrespected me or did, did this, rather than figure out, okay, this is a conversation we need to have, um, and we need to treat. It, I need to treat them with respect and care and dignity. It turns into I need to make. I need to sort of uh, unleash, and 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 pour out my anger on them. And so you end up having catastrophic um, outcomes. Now about Canada and Africa at the same time, I just think that in Africa now, mm -hmm. um, I think the reporting is going up obviously because of technology and so on and so forth. But I think, the, I think violence just generally cuts across. What do you think, Daisy? Well, I saw you I, itching I, to I, say yes, something. No, <laughs> I, I, I really disagree because I think that it's inexcusable for anybody First of all, to resort to murder. Mm -hmm. let's, let's just start there because it is a criminal act. So to suggest that it's a cultural thing and everything, um, roles have not changed recently. Mm -hmm. The idea of women getting educated, women entering the workplace, women have been doing this since you know the 60s, the 50s. So then the men are slow in catching up if this is, a, if this is an issue because women are leading the world. So you cannot attribute it to um, the, the, the changing roles and the close proximity of changing roles because in as much as the roles are changing for the men, the roles are changing for women and the same pressures that men have are the same pressures that women are also being subjected to. In fact, if you look at it, we have so many single uh, women headed households because men have abdicated their role you don't see the women going off to kill the men you know you have so many women who have been let down by men where they actually because of the changing roles you find women have contributed significantly to relationships to marriages and then the man just walks away you don't find her going to kill this man so i don't think that that is excusable i do think however that in different jurisdictions, we can look at different things. I think that like in Kenya, for instance, one of the most troubling things is that we have shown that violence as a means of resolving conflict mm -hmm. is acceptable. 
and it has been displayed by our leaders because how do we resolve political conflict mm -hmm. we fight we engage in violence and even murder mm -hmm. and there are no consequences to it or very few consequences so it has become an accepted avenue of people resolving um uh, their their differences okay mm -hmm. um so i think that's one thing that we can attribute it and a lack of consequences so you actually think that you can get away with it okay so there's that there's that silent communication and even though they don't realize it because even when you look at these days the way the children they do the demonstrations haki etu and all because they're learning mm. from our politicians from our teachers and from all but then i also do think that when you look at the same statistics now the way you've given them you know kenya and Canada, yeah. I think we must also look at the collapse in interpersonal relationships. And I think that that may be attributed to a rise in technology because we're not learning how to build relationships or even form proper relationships. And I think this has also been investigated in terms of the growth of social media, where people have friends on social media and you become really, really good friends. You've never met, <laughs> you've never done anything. So you don't, the traditional skills of building relationships, building friendships, learning how to quarrel, learning how to resolve issues in an amicable way may also be attributed to this poor conditioning of the way people are growing. People are not learning how to, to, to build proper relationships and to resolve issues. Everything has gone digital. Everything is instant, you know? I, I think there's a different uh, aspect to it because if you look at it technically, femicide is just violence against women going bad. Yes. Yeah. And if you look, there, there was, I mean, I have so many statistics to throw at you, <laughs> but like um, there, there was a survey done in South Africa and there were women also included in this survey. Yeah. And they were being asked, at what point is it okay for a man to hit a woman? So you have examples like um, the food was burnt, or neglecting the children, or um, not engaging in conjugal rights, or what was the other one? Uh, not, not saying that you're gonna be home late. Yeah. So the, there was only very slight difference between men saying, yes, this is a reason why uh, it, it, you're allowed to be violent against a woman, and women saying the same thing. And the, the actual comparison in terms of percentage was only pl plus or minus five percent or so. Yeah. So maybe those are the things that I, I, I really don't want us to say, okay, this is why um, yeah. this is happening. It's because of A, B, and C. But how do we get out of it? How do we get out of that funk, for lack of a better word, that we put ourselves into? Yeah. You, ultimately, there's a huge cultural shift. And there's a, signif a significant um, result of it is violence that we see. People are incapable of First of all, just as a result of that um, cultural shift, fam the family unit is falling apart. You have mm -hmm. um, a huge number of kids who are not even raising, they're raising themselves basically, and you have technology. And, and so the family unit, and, and we're really tending to look more Western, Westernized as time goes by. And what that means is individualism has taken the place of uh, being a social, co more people being more integrated in community where if, some, if something goes wrong in the, you know, back in the day in a community, there are elders, there's a, an extended family that's involved. Now, people now, pretty much we are on yourself. So if somebody, something goes wrong in a family unit, is the, f the, the family unit tends to have to resolve it. And I'll tell you something, in, in, the, in the years that we've done a lot of marriage uh, experiences and, and helping couples that are dealing with difficult. One of the biggest problems, one of mm. the biggest challenges that couples face, married couples face, is loneliness. And you, you would think, and when we really? found this out, yeah, we were shocked. And, and you would think that when you're with someone, that that's supposed to take care of, you know, that whole loneliness But what thing. do they attribute this loneliness to? That's well, the loneliness is, 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 we're just lonely as a couple, it's just the two of us. But socially, it's not enough. You need a greater community. This is the two of you cannot meet each other's needs. And so what happens is the stress levels in that relationship, uh, because it's just the two of you, you're fighting, you're dealing with all these things, it's just the two of you are very pronounced. And if somebody has violent tendencies, and, and, and a lot of our culture is, is violent. I mean, like she, she made mention of, you know, how people, you know, even our leaders and politically, mm. how people are expressing themselves. In Kenya, if you're rough and violent, you're gonna get your way. People are mm. rough in traffic. 
politicians have to be rough. And we've somehow okayed, that has become okay. And so because of that, when you put two people together, they are, you're going to have people lashing out. Let me just take you a, a, a bit to the side, uh, Pastor Wa. We were having a discussion before he came on, and he was telling me that most of the people that he does counsel come to him maybe after he speaks at a wedding. So that's, that, to me, that tells me that people are reluctant to even deal with some of the issues they have. They don't even know they have issues. Mm -hmm. So, so how, how does that come about? What, what have you managed to unearth from that? Well, you have to talk about it. Um, it's it, bringing up issues. It's, it's interesting. One of the big platforms is just weddings because the, the family is there and and there's real pain. I mean, I, I I get up to speak. You know, we'll do the, you know, we'll join the couple, have the ceremony, and then you know have a few minutes to make some remarks. And I can tell you, time and time again, there's people sitting. And I'm looking across, and there's people crying when I'm when I'm talking. I'm just bringing up issues that we have to resolve in marriage or in relationships. Um, and, and certainly there's violence in people, even in relationships where there's violence happening and people are closed up because, you know, when you think about if a woman is being abused in a marriage and she's thinking, you know, I, I can't tell anyone. I mean, mm. first of all, there's a shame element. Uh, I'm going to shame my, my husband. I'm going to shame my spouse. Um, then there's, you know, people are going to talk about us, what's going to happen. My, my, my relationship might end and I might be in financial problems. Uh, and so unless there is an intentional outreach into family life, and we really have, I mean, we really think that anyone that's interested in leadership has to look at how we sort of reaching out into families and actually ensuring that the family structure is sustained and helped. Mm -hmm. So even the narrative around what a husband is, what a wife is, what a boyfriend or a girlfriend is, is, is sort of aligned. We have, a, we have um, people are able to know what it is so when there are difficulties in, in some of these relationships that happen where a boyfriend is killed, a girlfriend, stuff like that, that people know, you know, how to respond. And, and, and I don't think that unless that narrative is controlled and guided, uh, I don't think we're going to do well. But you know, um, it, it, I guess it gets to a point where it crosses the line. Yeah. And when legally speaking, uh, whether or not you do have pressure, it doesn't matter in the eyes yeah. of the law if you take an axe and hack somebody's head off. Yeah. So I, I don't, um, in terms of governance and in terms of, I guess, policing, at, at what point does somebody who, face, who is in this trouble, at what point will they expect to receive some kind of protection? Well, first of all, unfortunately, um, many of the systems that should be in place to rescue people from such situations are not in place. Okay, because we should have a social system, a Is social system. They're not in system, place, or they are collapsed. there, but no. Okay, they've collapsed. Most of the ones, at least that I know, because mm -hmm. um, within our sector, of course, we deal with these things. So we have places that we can recommend, we can we can refer mm -hmm. people to. Mm -hmm. But most of these safe houses are run by civil society organizations. So you only refer them and to safe houses. Is yes, there any I mean legislative the framework at all? The, the, right now, apart from um, penalties within certain statutes, you mm -hmm. know, sexual offenses act, and of course the penal code. By the way, murder of anybody, mm -hmm. whether male or female, yeah. is a crime. Yeah. Okay. It's a capital offense. Yeah. Okay. So there is no crime called femicide. Okay. There is crime called murder. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is uh, sexual, there's the domestic violence. We have the domestic violence law that recognizes uh, violence within the home front. Mm -hmm. There it is there. And there is a schedule of, uh, you know, uh, penalties. Mm -hmm. However, we do not see the necessary um, concern coming from the duty bearers because we do need to have a system that can protect people while also penalizing you yeah. know, the offenders. Let me remind you about mm -hmm. the incident of a woman from um, the northern part of Kenya, which was very well publicized, who had been stabbed in the head by her husband. You remember, she was even flown to yeah. Nairobi mm -hmm. with the knife, you know, still embedded in her skull. This woman was treated. She was counseled. But because we don't have those systems, she was sent back. Right. She was actually sent back to the same... Uh, I get what you, you mean. Yeah. To, 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 to the same place. She was sent to the same husband. 
But not only that, the cultural aspect is also a very serious one because of the shame. You see, and it goes back to the low status of women within the society, mm -hmm. culturally, where women are, are taught that they are supposed to take these beatings, yeah. that they are supposed to, a good woman keeps quiet, a wo good woman keeps things within the family. So you will find they are sexually violated. Children are sexually violated, sometimes by your spouse. Mm -hmm. But because you don't want to shame the spouse, sure. you don't want to shame the family, you don't want to take it out of the family, how will people see me, you know? So there is a shame that is attached to it, mm -hmm. you know? There are also some cultures that actually encourage mm -hmm. uh, men to beat their women as a sign of affection. Uh, affection. That, uh, you know, um, if my husband doesn't beat me, he, he, doesn't, love he doesn't love me. But I think it falls in the same category, yeah. like the harmful uh, cultural practices for which we have laws mm -hmm. these days. Oh. Because there are cultures that teach, unless you undergo certain rituals and certain cuttings and all, you are not fully woman. And for you to be accepted within that community, for you to be able to get a husband in mm -hmm. that community, you must go through this uh, procedure. And in many cases, many of these women end up having lifetime problems related to it. So it's a cultural as aspect. But this is cured when you have government being very deliberate about it. Mm -hmm. Look at how they've gone about it in Rwanda, of course, informed by the kind of violence, you know, that took place in that country. But they have zero tolerance to gender-based violence of any kind, yeah. whether it is domestic or by a non-intimate uh, partner. They do not tolerate it. And the, the, the gender violence units are within the police. Yeah. So that it is not like in Kenya, where sometimes you call police when you have domestic situations, and they say that they cannot intervene because it's a right. domestic. Yeah, right. you know? two so yeah. so it, it really does need a lot of advocacy around it, re-education of our duty bearers, but also to push this to to push duty bearers to actually recognize and give women due status as citizens in terms of even recognizing when we have high levels of women being killed or dying for whatever reason mm -hmm. that yeah. the state is actually concerned that citizens are dying not just women because sometimes when we call it femicide sometimes when we call it gender-based violence it almost diminishes the the the, the, right. the, the, the um, the criminality. I think in an attempt actions. to get scale, right. to, to show the scale of yeah. femicide. But it almost looks like, oh, s that's a women's problem. Exactly. It's not. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a governance issue. I like what you say about Rwanda, because also just the other day in Sierra Leone, um, they <coughs> declared sexual violence a national disaster. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was because there were 8,500 cases in one year. Yeah of the whole and and about half of them involving children mm. yeah. now because we know most african countries do not have those structures in place yeah. mentally speaking yeah. how do you break it down because i i feel like okay as much as there are a lot of women who also do not see eye to eye on this thing yeah. most of the perpetrators of this are actually male yeah so just based on the discussions you've had, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if you've had instances where you've managed to help somebody reduce their levels of aggression. Yeah. I, I think there's a term called toxic, toxic, toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. Yeah. Maybe you can say what you think about toxic masculinity. Yeah. And if, if there is a way yeah. without, um, if you have no support from government to be able to deal with something like that. Yeah. So, so first of all, the, I, I think, just speaking on from what she said, one of the big problems we have I don't think it's even laws, having laws in our, in our, in, in our African context. I think it, it's, it's, um, it's enforcement. Because mm -hmm. you can write beautiful laws. We have beautiful laws yeah. in this country. But there's no enforcement. No one is actually uh, pushing for these laws to be effected. You know, when, even think about when a woman is abused. Just the mere thought, okay, so what happens next? It's, it's not something that we, we just don't think, okay, so I'm going to go in such and such a places or such and such a number I'm going to call and post that. This is the support I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. We just don't have it. And so that's a huge part. I mean, I'm sure she, she and her team and her, you know, people have to look into pushing the that's people. That's where the in, activism comes Yeah, in. Yes. you know, they've got to make noise <laughs> and say, guys, you've got to put money into it. Resources have to be allocated. Mm -hmm. I think as someone who's, and I've sat with couples who've experienced this and families that have, have gone through this, um, aggression, uh, men are naturally more aggressive. That's just, yeah. you know, that's, that's part of the um, being a man. But I think that 
the toxicity comes in when when you have for for lack of a better word i call it fathers i think mm -hmm. in, in in society mm -hmm. and i think that uh, the denigration of the the role of fathers and men who and not just biological Fa father fathers father as a but role or father as a role not just father i mean you okay. know you, yeah. you you can have many kids but you know that that doesn't mean <laughs> anything but that role where you you, it, it's actually, they did a survey, mm -hmm. um, I think is in uh, Pumalanga in, in South Africa, in a national park. Um, they had young elephants that were going rogue and just going crazy. And they didn't know what to do because they, they were very aggressive and rough. And so I, I think one of the scientists said they, they, would, they would need to get a male jumbo from, to bring to the park because it was just the young bulls. Mm -hmm. There were no older bulls in there. And so they've, they actually got one from Kenya down there. And they say immediately the the behavior changed, the aggression ended because there was now a bull uh, in the in the in the park. And I can tell you for a fact, even this whole this conversation does need significant men to lead it. And these are the voices in society who are able to speak and say, uh, and these these are your pastors, these are your political leaders, these are. Uh, chiefs and people in just strategic places and fathers in their homes mm. um, and, and they get empowered. One of the things that bothers me is that this sometimes this conversation does get bogged down into all men are violent, all men are pigs, all men are dogs, all men are violent. <laughs> and I think that the, the problem with that, really the problem with that is that it sort of paints all men as collaborative in this, yet we really cannot win this war uh, against femicide without men. We need True. men to be involved and to spearhead that. So I, th I feel like if we can get to a place where we're enforcing that um, and, and allowing the significant voices, male voices in society to begin to spearhead this conversation, say, so, you know, when this has to end. You know, um, I, I, I like that you say that. And uh, I'm just going to give you an example. I want to narrow it down now to Kenya. Just the other day, we had a famous Kenyan radio presenter saying that, you know, um, women should not accept gifts from men if they don't want to be romantically involved with them. Right. And a lot of people, a lot of people supported this on social media. You just, like, even there's, there's even another example where somebody say, oh, so-and-so posted a picture of this lady. She stopped taking my calls. What should I do? And somebody says, ax her, you know? <laughs> yeah. So mm. what would you say about that? Two things. One, there's a lot of stupid stuff going on on social media, and and that there's obviously people doing some dark things, but also there's uh, saying some dark things. But I also think that again, it just points to um, I, I just don't think that the 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 whole narrative between male and female relationships, how they should be approached for men. I don't think it even exists. I think it's still very. Uh, it's like find your way. Caveman. It's like, you know, get a club, go, you know, find someone, drag them into your cave. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and sadly so. So, again, I think that there are, there are elements of, of having um, this being spoken by the voices in our, in our society. And I think their voices were not allowing to come to the... One of the things that bothers me, for example, is the conversation even in the media is very political based. I, in fact, I stopped watching local television because of that local news because of that i mean like 80 percent of the news is just bad politics and there are actual real issues like this one that need a deeper conversation and and that need more involvement and that's actually getting the players who are involved in this to come to the forefront um and it's not happening and so it almost feels as though you know, young men are left by themselves to figure out what what needs to happen there's no voice that's saying hey that 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 needs to be dealt with and and i think that then you have enforcement of existing laws mm -hmm. that both protect women that speak against violence and we need to see them actively put out like somebody put hand their hands on someone and ooh, they yeah they, they faced it. yeah they faced it and we publicize that we say you know if you try and do this you're going to be in problems that's going to deter people w what do you think daisy about the kenyan situation I do think that we have very, very bad role modeling mm -hmm. um, of our men. Yeah. I do agree. The collapse of the family unit is something that actually should alarm us all. Because the family is the basis of your society. 
and we do have a complete collapse of the family unit. What does it mean to be a family? What mm -hmm. does it mean to be a couple? And the place of men in society. I do think when you look at, um, m at the macho men or the men that are now role modeling our young men, they are violent. They're violent. Mm -hmm. Violent politicians, you know, um, yeah. this uh, rap, which is generally very violent music, you yeah. know, generally. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and also, there's no nurturing. So there's a very poor conditioning yeah. of young men. And I do think to a certain extent, you know, our young people, they are being very badly role modeled, you know, yeah. about what it is that they are supposed to expect and how they're supposed to behave and all that. So th they're also Ill, uh, poorly prepared for addressing uh, challenges that they will meet with in day-to-day -day life, uh, very poorly conditioned on how to handle yeah. themselves in difficult situations. And they're also not being conditioned for rejection, you know, that it's okay when somebody says no walk away it's actually okay to walk away yeah. this is a problem this is a problem but I, I i go back to also how we have shown that we resolve our conflicts we use violence mm -hmm. for aggression. conflict resolution yeah. we use aggression and the more aggressive you are the more you know macho you are that's when you are considered a hero look at the research that was done by the Aga Khan University when they, they, they researched among the youth the role models that they said that the people they admire very shocking yeah. really these ought not to be the role models of anybody yet that is their aspiration they're being role modeled uh, uh, along you know these people and I think also what are we watching the you know secondary sources of our socialization media yeah. mm -hmm. not just uh, the news items but the programs the movies, yeah. the movies. Yeah. what are people what what kind of uh, games are people playing online and everything when you look at it you'll see a lot of violence you know a lot of violence yeah. is in there so what are we saying because this is how we are conditioning our society this is how we are conditioning our communities i'll go back to the example of rwanda one of the things they've done aside from uh having zero tolerance to uh any form of gender-based violence mm -hmm. they also have an entire ministry it is called the ministry of gender and family protection mm -hmm. so that they put the family at the center of the transformation of their nation and it is working you yeah. know for their society i know there are people who have other views yeah. but we went there actually we, we we as the national women's steering committee which we host um at the crown trust mm -hmm. we actually went to rwanda we were going to you know figure out what is it that they've cracked in terms of you know getting women into the leadership and decision making sphere because mm -hmm. rwanda are number one in the world but we also saw the value that they place on the woman and the family, the family unit. And I think that these are some of the practices that we must look at and begin to yeah. consider borrowing. And I think the church and religious institutions really need to play a stronger role in being able to shape the moral character and the moral values of the people. Because we also have a very convoluted sense of values yeah. as, as people, you know. That's why somebody can actually say, you know, I treated this one out uh, and she stopped taking my calls and somebody says, ask her. How does yeah. that become an right. acceptable conversation in a decent community? Right. You know, how, I, does, I, how is that a, 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 an allowable conversation? I feel like there's a lot that needs to be said and nobody really has specific answers. Yep. But I like, I like the examples that have been coming from Rwanda mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what you were talking about loneliness. I think that really popped up for me. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but maybe we can just have um, a closing statement from each of you. Yeah. Um, one particular aspect that I, 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 I think we should touch on is women empowerment. So in, in, when it comes to women empowerment, how do we take this to the next level to be able to resolve a situation like this? I say, first and foremost, women's lives matter. And it's not a hashtag. Women's lives do matter because they are a very critical component of our society. And so while putting women in the center of change, we cannot run away from the fact that we must do this together with men. So it's time for us to actually realize that we actually we have a serious problem on our hands and this is not going to go away by just talking about it we need to sit down and we need to come together as a society mm -hmm. and begin to look at where are we failing we need to address our value system as a people and we need to ascribe value to every human life 
Yeah. What would you say in a social setting? Like, if you in in a relationship that's toxic, yeah. or in a, in any kind of relationship, so yeah. to speak, how does a woman empower herself? Yeah, I think every woman who's in any relationship cannot be in a relationship by themselves. Mm. That means that the people who are closest to her, these are close family members and close friends, who are actually outside of the relationship, who can be able to see and speak into, you know, if things start going wrong into that relationship. If, you, if you're in a relationship with someone who's violent, who has violent tendencies, you have to seriously consider if you want to be in that relationship. And it's okay to walk out of relationships. Um, there, are, there are ways to do that, and, 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 but certainly do not stay in a violent relationship. There are people I have actually said you need to get out. Um, and one of the messages I know the church puts out a lot is that God hates divorce. Uh, or God hates separation. So, so what? And when you when that's not extrapolated correctly, what what ends up happening is people stay in dangerous situations. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that you know don't pray, but please don't pray in that house. I mean, <laughs> if somebody comes and sticks you know a machete on your throat and says you know I'm gonna kill you, that's that's too late. I so, so when you say, say just let me just clarify when you yeah. say that in a relationship. You're, you're not alone in that relationship. Does that mean you need to include your you larger do. family? Yes. You, in do what's going on? you do need to. You do need to include your larger family. You have to make sure that they are aware of what's going on. Um, a lot of this uh, incidents with this violence happens. A lot of times, sometimes family doesn't know. Uh, the people who look and say, "Okay, she's being mis mistreated." There's nobody that can see that and help pull someone out. Um, that's what I'm saying. And the second thing I think that's very important for me is. Um, a political conversation needs to change. The people that are coming into power have to be involved in enforcement of laws that protect women mm -hmm. uh, and girls. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a parent. I still, interesting, I still do not feel safe. I have a 12 year old. I do not feel safe having them walk up and down the streets of Nairobi by mm -hmm. themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Well, thank you, Daisy. Thank you. I think because when one person was talking, there was a lot of head uh, nodding on the other side. That means that we've managed to learn a lot from each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And hopefully even the audience has managed to learn a lot from us. So um, today we've had, as you know, Pastor Wa and Daisy Amdani on, in studio here with us talk about femicide, talk about gender-based violence in general, talk about how you can deal with it emotionally, how to deal with it in a family setting, and hopefully you've been able to learn some something or two from this conversation. If you have any contributions to make, please hit us up on our social media channels at CGTN Africa on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and even comment on the stories on our website. Thank you for watching.